Good evening and welcome to our continuing devotional series on the seven churches from the book of Revelation. Tonight we're going to be taking a look at the last church, the church at Laodicea. We don't know exactly when that church was established, but we know that it was in existence uh, when Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians because he wanted his letter written or read in the Laodicean church and the Laodicean letter read in the Colossian church. We also don't know what that Laodicean letter was. Uh, some speculate it was one of his other epistles that had made it to Laodicea and was then to be transferred to the church in Colossians. Uh, I think, like uh, many other scholars, that Paul actually wrote a letter specifically to the church at Laodicea, but that letter was not preserved. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us. Uh, Paul makes reference in Corinthians to having written to them a third time. Uh, we only have two of his letters preserved. Uh, there was no Zoom, no Skype, no cell phones. Communication was by word of mouth or by letter. So uh, there were probably many, many letters written by the apostles and church leaders to different people and churches that are not preserved. Um, but what we can be sure of is that what God wanted preserved was preserved because God is ultimately responsible for preserving his word through the millennia, which he has done. So whatever this letter was to the Laodiceans, we don't know. Um, but it was an, uh, an active church at the time when Paul was writing his prison epistles. If we can pull up the map, you'll see that there is... Um, Colossae, the, the Colossian church, Laodicea, and Herapolis, they're all located very close to each other. Uh, Colossae was less than 20 miles from Laodicea. Herapolis was even closer to Laodicea. And this plays into our understanding of the hot, cold, and lukewarm that we're going to get to in a minute. So let's take a look at the scripture. We'll read through the passage and then we'll, we'll delve into it. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, my, uh, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so Jesus starts out through, his, uh, through the Apostle John declaring himself to be the faithful and true witness. And the beginning of creation, we know that um, in Colossians we read that you know, cre he cre created all things. By him all things were created and for him. Uh, he is also the creation of the church. Um, he's the firstborn from the dead. It is because of what he has done that the whole church has been founded. So you can look at Jesus as being the beginning of creation in the natural sense and also in the, um, uh, the spiritual sense of the church. This was in direct contrast to the Laodiceans who were unfaithful. Um, unlike the other six churches, there was not a single thing commended to, um, to this church. Even the, uh, the dead church at... Uh, Sardis was uh, had at least a few faithful people that were that were uh, commended. Uh, Laodicea had zero things to be uh, commended. It was only um, condemnation for their behavior, which we're going to get um, get 
get into. So what is this hot, cold, and lukewarm? And having an understanding of those three cities and um, the geography and some history behind them sheds a lot of light onto that. At first look, you might think, um, well, cold might be spiritually dead and hot would be spiritually uh, on fire and lukewarm would just be kind of in the middle. But that wouldn't be in keeping with, uh, first of all, Jesus wouldn't want them to be spiritually dead. Um, and uh, we know from their condemnation by Jesus that they were in a, already in a bad state. So what is this cold or hot? Well, it turns out that at Colossae, the water supply there was very cold and refreshing and pure. There was a cold mountain stream um, that fed the water supply of the town. And so they had very good, cold, refreshing water. Uh, by contrast, at Hierapolis, it was noted for its therapeutic hot springs, and people would travel there to bathe in the hot springs and, and enjoy their therapeutic value. Laodicea, in spite of it being a wealthy area, did not have a good water supply. It had to have its water brought in through aqueducts and pipes. And by the time it got to Laodicea, it was barely drinkable. Um, some think because of the proximity to Heropolis that the water might have been piped from there, in which case it was probably high in sulfur. If you've ever drank sulfur water, you can imagine lukewarm uh, sulfur water that's traveled for miles picked up organisms. They didn't have any water filtration systems back then. So the water was barely drinkable, if drinkable at all, by the time it got to Laodicea. And so that's where this cold and hot and lukewarm come from. Cold and hot were both refreshing in different ways. Um, the lukewarm was disgusting. And I got thinking about this as I was looking and studying this, and it, it hit me that cold and hot are also ways to prevent decay. We use refrigeration to prevent our food from spoiling. We use heat to sterilize things. So um, both have a preserving aspect to them, whereas lukewarm is the conditions where things go bad. And it was so... Um, God's view of the church was so severe that he says, um, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Not just spit you out, but the Greek word that's used here literally is, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. I'm going to forcibly eject you. Basically, he's saying, you make me sick. That's how bad they were uh, spiritually. So what was it about this church that... Um, caused Jesus to take such a strong stand against them. So we read, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing. They had gotten to the point where they didn't need God in their minds. Laodicea was a very wealthy church. Uh, it was a very wealthy area. It had taken over... Um, was in the process of taking over from Colossae as being the center of trade in the area and eventually um, fully took over that uh, status. Uh, they were, again, a very affluent city. Um, in both A.D. 17 and A.D. 60, earthquakes hit the area, um, destroyed many of the cities. Rome offered financial aid to help rebuild. In both cases, Laodicea refused, saying, we've got enough money, we're going to do it ourselves. So they had this very self-sufficient attitude in the culture, and that had come into the church. Um, Jesus says, um, you don't know, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked. That poor, blind, and naked all contrast to the culture that's around them. So we already mentioned, you know, they were very wealthy, they were very affluent, they were very self-sufficient, they were a center of banking in the area. 
um, blind. And so it, while they were spir- uh, materially rich, they, the church was spiritually bankrupt. He, then he uses the term blind. Well, it turns out there was a medical college, a medical school in the city of Laodicea, and there was a uh, well-known ophthalmologist that practiced there. And the area was known for a powder called Phrygian powder, which was used to make eye salves and bombs and um, that were supposed to help treat eye conditions. So Jesus is saying, you have medicine for your eyes here in your city, but you are spiritually blind. Naked. The area was renowned for a very fine black wool that was used to make uh, high quality raiment that was uh, prized clothing. And so Jesus is saying, You have these beautiful material clothing, but yet you are spiritually naked. So all of these things the, the hot, cold, lukewarm, the poor, blind, naked all played into the culture, they would have known exactly what point Jesus was making through the writings of the Apostle John. And in fact, the, when we think about that, uh, that's, again, evidence that these were not just allegorical writings. These were you know, letters written to real churches, real people, real situations, and that's borne out by the historical uh, context that we see these terms that are used uh, to condemn the, the church. So Jesus goes on to say, um, you, know, you don't know the, how bad your spiritual condition is. I desire, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, um, white raiment, pure clothing, so these were all um, addressed to the, the cultural wealth that they had in the area, but contributed or contrasted to their very poor and depraved spiritual condition. He says, you need pure gold, not the material gold of your city. You need spiritual gold. You need the holiness from God. You need God's truth. You need to get that from me. You're not going to get that from your culture. Um, white clothing. When we are in Christ, we're clothed in Christ's righteousness. Um, if it's a reference to that, it would indicate that the people in the church weren't even saved. They were uh, in need of the covering of Christ's righteousness. Um, this would have been... 30, 40 years after Paul wrote his letter to Colossians and referenced the Laodicean church. I doubt that it was totally made up totally of unbelievers by this point. It could very well be a reference similar to Revelation 19.8 where the pure clothing is a reference to the righteous acts of the saints. He's saying you need to put on my righteousness and be doing the things that I want you to be doing that are righteous and good um, and not the the evil and depraved works of the culture you're in. Eye salve, again, in contrast to the medicine they had in the area for their eyes, but Jesus was calling them spiritually blind. Um, They needed to have their eyes open, their eyes healed, to be able to see the truth of God's word, to be able to see their need. Uh, And then we get to um, Jesus' comment, because I love you, I'm rebuking you because I love you, and I want you to repent. I want you to uh, come back to me. And you're only going to find that in me. You're not going to get it from the culture that's around you. Well, we um, then get to that very famous verse, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. We use that verse a lot in witnessing um, to tell a person that they need to open the door of their heart to Jesus and uh, he will come in and have fellowship with them. Uh, And that's true. But in the context, it's talking about the church. 
Jesus is looking for just one person to open the door of that church and let him back in so he could have fellowship um, with them. And so we fast forward that to today and look at our culture. And I hope you had a chance to catch Pastor Rob's sermon on Sunday um, in the context of prayer, demonstrating our dependence and reliance on God. The Laodiceans had gotten to a point where they didn't need God. They were self-sufficient, they thought. Um, and God is saying, no, you're in a, a bad state uh, to the point of making me sick and you really need me. So many churches today are doing things their way, have been influenced by the culture and um, don't see their dependence that they need on God. And so a church that has no dependence on God really isn't a church. Um, it's not honoring to God. So it's a warning to us today, both as individuals and as a church. In Laodicea, the culture had so infiltrated the church that Jesus had to use these cultural um, identifications to point out to them just how far they were from God and how much they needed God. And so I think the question for us as individuals is in what ways have we allowed the culture to dull our relationship with God? Um, we as believers and as a church are to be changing the culture around us, not being changed by the culture. And so we need to ask ourselves, first of all, as individuals, have I allowed the culture to infiltrate my life in areas where I don't see my dependence on God anymore in certain areas of my life. And I think we need to do that as a church too. We should be praying corporately is, have we allowed the culture to impact our church in negative ways rather than us impacting the culture around us? So the, uh, the warnings to the church at Laodicea, um, while we have a spiritually alive church here now, any church is uh, a target for the enemy. And he wants to uh, water down our churches and to uh, cause people to not rely on God. So it's a temptation that can creep in, and it can creep in slowly. I doubt that uh, one day the Laodiceans got up and said, well, today we're no longer going to rely on God. I believe it was a you know, over a period of time, the culture just infiltrated the church. So it's a strong warning to us today that we need to be on guard always uh, that we are not being changed by the culture, but we are the ones who are impacting the culture around us. So I think that's what we can learn from uh, the church at Laodicea. So let's uh, close in a word of prayer. Our Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that you bring us and that we can learn from these uh, messages to the churches that we can apply even today, thousands of years later. I pray that you would help each of us to be on guard in our own hearts, that we would not allow uh, ourselves to diminish our dependence on you. And as we heard on Sunday, that we need to be in communication with you and we acknowledge that we need you in every aspect of our life and we pray the same for our church Lord that you would help us to be culture changers that we would be impacting the world around us in a positive way and that you would protect us from being influenced by our culture uh, in a negative way and so we just ask for your help and we again thank you for your word to us and your love for us and how you want us to uh, follow your ways because you know what is best for us. And we just thank you again in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us and have a good evening.